Welcome to the Full Dash Closure audiobook and podcast, episode number 18. Tonight, we are going to go through step by step the first long uh, form interview that the CEO of DoorDash, Tony Shu, has done in my recent memory. Everything that Tony has done uh, prior to this has really been like uh, CNBC or MSNBC quick financial reports uh, at, at the quarterly, uh, after the quarterly meetings with, with just uh, softball interviews, no details. And of course, those, those interviews on broadcast TV are made for uh, people in finance and for consumers they are not made for dashers. So that's, that's not who, uh, that's not who Tony Chu was talking to in any of his prior interviews that I've seen. He's been sp speaking to technologists. He's been speaking to other people, but, but, uh, a few days ago, Tony Chu sat down for an interview with the rideshare guys, Harry Campbell, and that was almost a 40 minute interview. And so we have something uh, really exciting to look at. And we have Tony addressing the rideshare guy, Harry Campbell, somebody that knows the gig economy, the industry, the apps. And uh, I want to, I want to kind of I want to put a plug in for for Harry's job. So I've I've seen a lot today, and I was on the live uh, premiere of the interview this morning uh, in the live chat. And and there were people before that, and and after that, during that, that were critical of Harry Campbell for not asking uh, maybe the tough DoorDash questions. The challenge to that is. Harry's the first guy to get an interview with Tony Hsu of this form, um, really asking him substantive questions or at least relevant questions about uh, DoorDash and their practices and the apps and and the labor uh, dasher aspect of DoorDash. And so that's that's very, very valuable to us. And rest assured, had Harry you know tried to make this to uh, uh, a hostile interview and asked the very tough questions. Number one, he probably wouldn't have gotten an interview with Tony in the first place and we wouldn't have anything to watch and we wouldn't have anything to learn. Um, so I, I actually commend Henry, uh, Harry just for getting uh, Tony Sue on the record for us, for showing us that, Hey, here's a guy, he's actually answering some questions. We can get an idea of, of what he's saying. And, and then, you know, my point to other people is we can fact check that ourselves. Harry doesn't need to fact check it in real time. A, a CEO of a global corporation and a billionaire is not going to sit for a fact check interview while somebody argues with them. That's not going to happen. So what we can do is we can get them on the record. Then we can assess what's truthful, what's not truthful. Uh, and, and that's what I plan to do with you tonight. So I hope that sounds interesting to you. Uh, on the screen here is a, a clip that I tweeted out yesterday, which is an email that I received. And it's it's very, very strange. And I want to start off <clears throat> a few uh, with a few little uh, examples so that people can understand the landscape through which we're going to look at this interview of, of Tony Hsu. Uh, the ad is from DoorDash to me, actually me, uh, make deliveries now, period. That's, that's, the, that's the first offer. So they're offering that you can make deliveries. Um, I don't know anybody in the world who has dreamt of making deliveries as a hobby or as a, as a pastime. Um, the second sentence says, and money, comma, two, period. So if that's not uh, showing you the disregard and animosity that DoorDash shows toward Dashers, nothing will. 
Become a driver and deliver with DoorDash. Become a driver with DoorDash. Alternative to hourly job. What hourly job is in an alternative to? What hourly job makes you gamble, makes you use all your own assets, makes you risk your life in your automobile, makes you pay all your expenses, and makes you take all of the business risk, time risk, and everything else on behalf of a, of a global corporation? Not just any global corporation, probably the most evil global corporation to come uh, to come along in decades, maybe in the history of global corporations, because DoorDash is not a real company. DoorDash is, is what uh, you call it, an asset-free uh, corporation. They, they have technology, which is AI, corporate AI, and through that, they fleece merchants, they gouge consumers, and they enslave labor through their gig apps. And we're going to talk about that tonight. We're going to see how Tony presents it. You'll see what I think of that. So that's uh, that's that ad. So so secondly, I'm going to take you through something that I wrote uh, last year. And it's the reason that I am here in the first place. I'm going to increase the size for you a little bit for anybody watching in case you want to go along and I'm going to put on um, my sunglasses. So I started off the the question has often been asked, what could be done or what's required to make DoorDash not a scam? How would you make DoorDash fair? How would somebody legislate it if they wanted to? And that's a very good question. The, the challenge with AI, as you would have heard in many of my broadcasts, if you listened before, or you would have read in my writing, is that there's two impossibility uh, scenarios, two twin impossibility scenarios with artificial intelligence. First, it is unexplainable. So not Tony Sue, not his lead engineer, nobody at DoorDash or anywhere else in the world can explain to you how DoorDash really works. Not only can they not explain it, they can't understand it either. So once once all these these uh, algorithms and 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 all this technology is put together on a platform like DoorDash, the uh, the way that it works is the way that it was created with the biases, with everything else, and with the motivations. The motivations of corporate AI are profit. The motivations of corporate AI are without employees is human destruction that that's the difference if there's no employees then the plight of humans uh in this case known as dashers uh otherwise known as uh, formerly known as employees uh if corporations have a diametrically opposed benefit scenario from uh the labor there is nowhere to go but down and how far will they go They'll go to enslavement. They'll go to using people. They'll go to uh, a market for app slavery across the world, in which case you fractionalize human labor such that uh, you put all the risk, all the strain, all the stress, all the gaslighting on a human being, and you just put humans on call. And that is that is a grim future. It's probably not one that that society or civilization civilization can survive. Uh, the gig economy already um, is not a job. It's not employment. It's not even a good way to make money for uh, taking the kids to a movie or anything else. The risk alone of the gig economy to your life, your possessions, and to your ability to make income makes the gig economy uh, nothing but a scam. This is the, the corporate world transferred risk from their back all onto the backs of not just any labor, but people of color, women, other minorities, workforces and, and labor forces that are traditionally disregarded, uh, exploited, and ignored. That's why they're getting away with it. So, you know, for dashers, if you're wondering if app slave is, is kind of a denigrating word, yeah, it, it is. I was one too. The reason it's a denigrating word is that that's the role that 
humans play in the gig economy. There is no independence. There is no transparency. There is no legitimacy. So I'm going to go ahead and take you through the civil rights, and then we're going to get to uh, the interview of Tony Hsu and his words. Civil rights are mandatory for the workforce of the gig economy, meaning safety, transparency, compensation, and fair conditions of contract work, including number one, end the pervasive psychological abuses of systematic wage depression inherent in all rigged gig app labor market simulations. Number two, end misrepresentations to deceive consumers and gig workers of the gig economy's game world selection, providing the illusion of independence and rigged market simulations where, which are overtly packaged by design as fraud. And, and that design by which they're, they're packaged as fraud is called dark patterns. So AI can take you down a route that is nothing but exploitative. That's what DoorDash is built on. Number three, end gamblified. That's a word that came from uh, future guest Vina Dubal, one of the foremost uh, legal minds in labor and in gig apps in the gig economy. So end gamblified gig apps that make income both unacceptably unreliable, impermanent, and patently unfair. So the name of Vina's article is The House Always Wins. So think of, think of DoorDash, think of all these gig apps as, as casinos. They're rigged. So the house always wins. The percentages are in their favor. In the short term, can you go home with more money than you came with? Maybe. On average, does the average person go home with, with a gain? No. Um, one thing that often happens also with gambling is the people uh, that win talk about it, and the people that lose either lie about it or don't talk about it at all. So you get a very overestimated level of success with gamblification. And I think that's what we see in the gig economy. And when you see shows like The Rideshare Guy and Sergio uh, Avedian, uh, who is a very interesting guy and understands this very well, you know, he, he talks about that uh, a lot. And it's really, really critical because when you go to gamble, you know you're going into a casino. You know you're being set up and you might go there for entertainment. You might go there for many reasons. You might go there for a show. You might be hanging out. There's there's lots of reasons to go to a casino, casino and gamble. Working is not gambling. Working requires compensation per unit of work, per, per hour, per unit of work, that kind of thing. So what the gig economy did, in addition to calling uh, app slaves independent contractors, which they are not, there is no valid contracts in the gig economy, nor is there any independence. So they they stole a term that's used by plumbers and lighting technicians and uh, and farriers that do horseshoes and everything else. Those are independent contractors. They find their work, they negotiate the rates, and all the material information is on the table. In the gig economy, it's an unsolvable equation. The the unethical criminal offers from the gig economy omit intentionally material information that the company holds. That's just fraud. They're just they're just defrauding app slaves. They're defrauding dashers. Number four, and all gambling gamified coercion in systems. Gig apps are ruthlessly designed to exploit and compel contractor performance of non-economically viable money losing tasks. So that's the point of all these programs and the stars and acceptance rating and all this stuff. It's all designed to coerce people to do something in the near term that's not in their best interests. That's that's what gig apps are 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 created for. And then as that goes forward, they do more and more and more and and the entire scenario becomes not in their interest. Uh, they also have the ability to to reward newbies, right? They can they can make you think that the, your first week was so great and you just want that high again. You just want to feel like you did that first week when you made good money. Well, it sounds like a drug habit, doesn't it? Sounds sounds like a lot of things that are uh, known crimes, 
in our society. And that's why this is a crime. It's an unprosecuted crime right now, but it's it's a crime. So gig apps coerce people. They use human frailty for corporate profit. They're, they're playing a chess computer or a, a computer that can predict 2 million predictions a second against a human being. There's, there's no way to win. So the, as, as Vina Duval's uh, article said, uh, the house always wins. So remember that. Number five, end the gaslighting of app slaves and the undisclosed nature of their gig app AI opponents, which exploit their every selection. Choices don't exist in a simulation. Rather, they are merely selections of presented data. So this is like Mario Kart. You can choose the color of your Mario Kart. You're not in the real world. You can't take your Mario Kart to the baseball game in Los Angeles. It's not a real world. You're in a simulation. Now, you're a real human. You're in the real world. You might talk with your friends. You might have stories about it. Heck, if you're good enough, you could go pro. It's still not the real world. You're a pro Mario Kart racer, right? And so think of that when you're looking at DoorDash. This is, this is a computer system. This is a simulation you're playing. It's not a real market. So it's pollution of a real market. It's a simulation of a real market, but it's not a real market. Uh, number six, stop harassing drivers, coercing and compelling acceptance of offers below their known threshold. So the, the acceptance rating demanded for, uh, for happy vibes from DoorDash has gone up and up over time. Uh, when I would dash... I mean, you would just get peppered. Some I saw somebody write the other day, but if I did 5,521 dashes, I would say I probably turned down 50,000 offers. So it's probably like a 10 to 1. So imagine how much time it took for me to react to 51 or 50,000 offers while I was driving, uh, while I was working, while I was doing other things. It's It's incredibly dangerous. It's an incredible waste of time. It will drive you crazy. It's designed to drive you crazy. It's designed to gaslight you. Um, number seven, and uh, there's apps that do this now, like Para App uh, that that Steve from Rideshare Rodeo talks about, and CEO David Picarell of uh, Para App talk about. So that has functions that eliminate the grind of a driver turning down 50,000 offers, you can set in your own limits. So number seven, uh, I wrote in quite a while ago, allow all laborers using gig apps to set automatic offer minimums and limit notification to independent contracts that meet standards of full and fair disclosure. Okay, so that's our first example of me asking for something that we can't have. It's the, with full disclosure, with uh, full transparency, the gig economy does not exist. It's already losing money. If it if it didn't have the scam and the coercion and the usage of human beings uh, as human fuel, it wouldn't exist. It can't exist. Uh, as I said the other day uh, on a podcast, uh, Kim Side Money Plans and and Zach Drives Fast were on there. Uh, if there was money to be made by delivering last mile. Uh, packages, DoorDash would not be outsourcing it to app slaves. DoorDash would have employees doing it because they would take the revenue. So the fact that they've spun it off to you is your first clue. There's no money to be made here. Um, number eight, fully disclose all required mileage, location data, expenses, time, driver saturation, and all other known data to laborers in real time, and gig economy corporate collusion. These guys spend hundreds of millions of dollars fighting legislation, uh, fighting any kind of regulations around the world. And I call it the gig economy corporate cabal because they all collude together with hundreds of millions of dollars, billions of dollars around the world of uh, buying off politicians and buying markets. It's very disgusting. Um, I also call that app colonization because this is going to be American corporations that are tasking app slaves around the world. It's pretty disgusting. This is, uh, if you thought colonization was bad, when it was humans doing that in person, doing it via technology and app slavery will be even uglier. Uh, corporations must, under all categories of labor, establish and maintain direct contact and accountability with operational labor. Recourse and access are critical to any level playing field. And uh, hey, look, a typo. I did that. So why is that so important? 
under all categories established and maintained direct contract because there is no accountability. DoorDash can deplatform and cancel somebody from their ability to 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 labor in that app. And if they become dependent and trapped on that for income, that's an overnight crisis. This happens a lot. Maybe sometimes for good reasons, maybe sometimes for bad reasons, maybe sometimes for no reasons at all. That's AI, right? So you've got AI now uh, putting people into human crisis where they lose their car, they lose their house, they can't feed their kids, all that kind of thing. Um, it's not serious to DoorDash because DoorDash, as Tony Hsu will sell us, claims to have 13 million dashers today that are active. 13 million. Um, that's news. That's about... Uh, that's about 9 million more than I think anybody truly knew. And so why is that? We'll, we'll talk about that too. But the key here is that a consumer or a laborer, an app slave, a dasher, whatever you want to call them, it is impossible, literally impossible to contact DoorDash. They functionally do not exist. You will re you will only be able to contact third-party support that is neither empowered nor tasked to help you and solve your problems. Could they spin it up somewhere to DoorDash, unbeknownst to you, and maybe someday you'll problem, your problem will get hurt or solved if it gets into the media or if, if you hire a lawyer or something? Possibly. But you have to make them. Um, they kept an amount of money uh, that I had earned for months, and uh, I'm a pretty tenacious guy. If there was somebody at DoorDash you could talk to, I was about to uh, to to lose my, lose my mind with support. Not only does support not have empowerment, but if you know anything about support, one of the critical elements of support is to log support issues. So when the person calls back in, they don't have to explain the same problem to somebody that can't help them. The person can say, oh, look, I see where you are. You've been you've been sent to the queue for specialty, right? And so that specialty queue would potentially allow a solution. It doesn't exist in DoorDash. So the fact that DoorDash has been able to be nothing but a shell entity of corporate AI and uh, market, market parasitics, uh, is not acceptable. There is no recourse. And the further and further we get away from any recourse with corporations, any human at all, what is what is left to us? Is this is this thing even real? Who does it benefit? Well, I mean, it benefits SoftBank and Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabian royalty and billionaires and Chinese investors. This is not uh, this is not good, wholesome American uh, innovation or just American innovation. It's not capitalism. It's not a business model at all. It's just fraud. Okay. So here we go. Uh, number 11. And then we're going to get to this, this interview, which is very exciting. Um, I am going to tell you that coming up at 730, we are going to raid my friends at Echoplex Media. They'll be kicking off the down ballot podcast at 730. So we'll jump right in there. So you can stick right here and then jump right into Echoplex and, and enjoy down ballot with Dave and the councilman. It's always a good time. So I hope everybody sticks around. That'll be again at 730. That gives us an hour and 20 minutes to go through 40 minutes uh, 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 approximately of, of Tony DoorDash, Tony Zoo video, Tony DoorDash. It's okay, Lady B. We understand. This is, this is spontaneous. I didn't even know what day the interview was coming out. It just came out today and it's just, it's just, uh, it's hot. It's real hot. So uh, redesign all gig apps to mute and disable operations while vehicle is in motion. The status quo of unrestrained driver harassment practices and gig app smartphone interactions qualifies both as a massive public safety risk and as a hideous violation of public trust in American field delivery operations. So, so Domino's and others proved to us uh, long ago that... Uh, Delivery driving is a very dangerous job. People can die. If you rush people, if you distract people, they will die. Uh, the gig economy is not concerned with that. People are underinsured. People are uninsured. People are at horrible risk. Again, one in five Amazon drivers has been injured on the job as, as per their own statistics in 2021. What's 20% of 13 million injuries uh, per year of 13 million drivers? Okay, well, that's... Uh, 
it's 2.6, right? So we could guess that a good couple million uh, app slaves a year are injured on the job in DoorDash alone, not not to say the rest of the gig economy. And, and that's not even like the attacks and murders and things that have been happening in this very isolated uh, task that people accept with their own car. Uh, the above number details, business practices, and workplace conditions are all part of, of a legitimate and legally operating enterprise or valid contract in the business world. Of course, the gig economy is anything but a legitimate and legal business model. Thus, fair standards and reasonable conditions will surely put each major corporate perpetrator, DoorDash, Uber, Grubhub, and Lyft, out of business while simultaneously eviscerating and publicly executing the gig economy as is just and right for societal good. Okay, then, so it must be. That's what has to happen for the good and survival of humanity. So uh, that's that's my concept of civil rights as they apply to the gig economy. And I I will make the argument to you and, and stick by it that if we allow corporate America to transfer all the risk onto the people and to manipulate us in a scalable design that can have millions of people working for a corporation that doesn't even have any employees. Um, you don't want that. And whether, uh, if we could wave a magic wand today and make every independent contractor of the gig economy, every mislabeled independent contractor, every app slave, every controlled, manipulated individual in the gig economy an employee, their lot wouldn't change. They'd still be underpaid. They'd still be overworked. They'd still be controlled by corporate AI. This is not acceptable. So, so this isn't, um, about a debate between Democrats and Republicans of whether, uh, whether this is a valid job category. This is about corporate fraud. This is about a dark scam, dark money, and a very evil corporation that is taking on the world. So without further ado, I'm going to jump over here to my friends um, at the Rideshare Guy. And again, my my great compliments to, uh, to Harry Campbell of doing such a fine job of, of just getting uh getting tony doordash on the record so um lady b i assume you're you're there uh, if you guys have any problem with the audio please let me know so i'm sitting here with tony shu from doordash i'm excited to chat you guys have just made a bunch of big announcements so uh thanks for having me and ready to chat yeah thanks for coming up from sunny la to doom and gloom san francisco <laughs> yeah actually i don't know for sure but do you say your last name tony Zhu? Shoe like the shoe you shoe. wear to try try to keep it easy. Yeah, the shoe okay. you wear. Shoe from DoorDash. Mm -hmm. All right. Appreciate your asking though. Yeah. You guys uh, just celebrated your ten year. Um, I guess what do you call it? A milestone announcement. What we we called it a dash anniversary in terms. Dash. Of, but yeah, it's our birthday. We launched First on June twenty first of twenty twenty uh, of twenty thirteen, and mm -hmm. so last week we celebrated ten years. Awesome. And for those dashers who you know maybe weren't around ten years ago, what was it like uh, ten years ago? Why'd you start the company and? Uh, <laughs> You know, what, what, uh, what did they miss 10 years ago? Well, 10 years ago is certainly pretty different from mm -hmm. where it is today. Um, my co-founders and I literally worked out of, you know, our apartment that we made shift into an office. Yeah. So 700 square foot place, two bedrooms, kind of. Mm -hmm. um, and it was really just all of the founders, you know, all yeah. four of us doing deliveries. And that's really, you know, how it all started. I mean, the real reason it wasn't even to build a business and delivery. Mm -hmm. It was to build a business to help local merchants, you know. Okay. So... Lies, lies, and damn lies. Okay, so where did DoorDash come from? DoorDash came from the Stanford startup garage class that is for graduate students and undergraduates. They make presentations. They make startup plans. They can then enter competitions. Uh, Tony and Stanley and Andy uh, entered the competition with the Y Combinator and were hooked up with some pretty significant money for their little Palo Alto delivery business that was designed for dense urban areas. So don't let Tony make you think for a minute that he ever envisioned that DoorDash could be this, number one. Number two, what did Tony not tell you about when he talked about his humble beginnings of helping local businesses and dashing with his good friends, Andy and Stanley? 
he didn't talk about uh, artificial intelligence, did he? What were they doing? Were they there for the good of humanity? No, they were figuring out how to program and, and strategize a platform that would use artificial intelligence to exploit markets for delivery. So they were doing their uh, evil due diligence is what they were doing. And don't let them believe, uh, present for a minute that they had a humble beginning. They were anything but humble. People like my mom, who pretty much has ran a local business, you know, mm. for over 30 years. Um, I worked at a Chinese restaurant that she used to. So now he's going to put independent businesses out of, out of business because he charges independent businesses much more than he charges corporate chains and McDonald's and all that. So this guy, and then he also has what we call a uh, ghost kitchen. So there are fake brands, Mr. Beast Burger and whatever other kinds of crap that, that they, chill out there. Mr. Beast Burger could be IHOP. It could be Denny's. It could be Waffle House. Mr. Beast Burger could be anything in your town. Uh, but DoorDash pollutes along with, they colluded with Uber Eats and Grubhub too, to have these fake brands on the market that they all serve. And so what does that do? If you have a local burger joint in your town, and now Somebody goes to DoorDash, they think there's a burger joint named Mr. Beast Burger that's now competing with you. So even if you're on the DoorDash platform, DoorDash platform is worse than the real world. In the real world, you only compete with real hamburger restaurants. In the DoorDash uh, world, not only are you paying more than the national chains, so you're being you're being gouged. You don't make any profit from a restaurant perspective on, on gig app orders. So it's marketing and keeping your employees busy at best. <laughs> and then to 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 top it all off, uh, there's there's no future for you to even exist because if DoorDash takes over, people won't know you're there. DoorDash isn't the phone book. DoorDash is a is a closed simulated market. So either you get in and you pay their extortion to exist in a town that DoorDash controls because what DoorDash wants to do as a technology company is have the, the infrastructure for every city in America, every small town, every big town. What does infrastructure means? That means they want to be your post office. They want to be UPS. They want to be FedEx. They want to run your errands. They want to do all these things with app slaves. So they want an underclass, a lower caste of people that will do all your errands and everything that you don't want to do in life uh, for the uh, profit of a corporate shell that doesn't even exist as a company. Wow. Um, pretty crazy stuff. I work at, you know, growing up and yeah. I've had fond me memories there and we were trying to help people like her to turn all of their businesses Such into digital lie. businesses. But, you know, I mean, it was just a few of us. And yeah. so, the first idea we kind of wanted to work on that we had heard loud and clear from a lot of merchants, people who sold food retail, was that they couldn't fulfill deliveries, which to us made no sense yeah. given that it was 2013. And so we got into it. Yeah, I, I, that's cool. I mean, I think I've heard the founding story before, but you're just sort of reiterating. I mean, I guess you were out there on the front lines doing deliveries. For the first two years, pretty <laughs> much every day. I'm speeding up this bullshit because really it's just all lies. And, and um, I highly encourage you to go to the Rideshare guy on YouTube. They have a great channel. They have great live shows regularly. Um, the Rideshare Go uh, show main show with uh, Sergio Avedian and Chris is on every Tuesday. That starts at 4 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time, I believe. You can see that on the Rideshare Guy channel. So, uh, again, props to them for, for their work and bringing this to us. Yeah, first two years, almost every, you know, yeah. uh, every day, all of the founders, I mean, actually, you know, in, in almost the entire company, yeah. you know, did this. I mean, we had, I mean, most of us didn't have a background in logistics or in delivery. And so to us, understanding all of the details yeah. and by doing every activity, whether it was deliveries, mm -hmm. creating menus, performing customer support, yeah. um, everything in between that yeah. was, you know, how we got to really understand, you know, the guts of this operation. Yeah. Okay. So they got to understand the guts of this operation so they could use their biases and their knowledge to screw humanity with corporate AI. Got it. 
Well, and I think, you know, we're going to kind of weave in and out of that, you know, based off the announcements today. But yeah. I think it is cool to talk about, you know, for Dashers to hear, you know, your experience as an early. So their announcements uh, that you'll hear about, they announced some that they that they allegedly treated some Dashers well and they had a celebration and they announced some new features, most of which are bullshit. So let's move forward. You know, Dasher. Early I don't Dasher. know. Were you calling them Dashers back then? Uh, we, we, we were. Uh, we didn't have a Dasher app, though, when okay. we started. And so it was actually. Uh, a very janky way of how we used to do yeah. dispatching. Um, but today, you know, um, so I've gotten to see the different evolutions yeah. of the product. Very cool. Well, let's talk about the product. So, you know, I've got my notes here, so I don't totally. So there you go. Tony just told you that without corporate AI, they could not run DoorDash, even when it was Palo Alto delivery. Are you getting that? So 15 factorial, if there was 15 drivers and 15 restaurants, that's over a trillion combinations. So dispatching human beings in mass quantities is not a simple task. That is why they're doing it this way to commoditize humans and to control them in mass. But again, listen to his words. He's telling you without corporate AI, they couldn't run Palo Alto delivery. Without corporate AI fleecing you and controlling your every move, they certainly couldn't run DoorDash. So again, he's proving it bought your announcement no problem. today um but you guys made some updates to the dasher experience which we're going to focus on earned by time uh, which is an offer dasher's guaranteed minimum hourly rate for act and delivery time um some updates you know to earn per offer post checkout tipping which yep. i think is pretty cool which um you know basically yeah. is going to allow customers to add or increase dasher tips up to 30 days dash along the way which i think is actually a really cool feature to you know if you're going somewhere you can kind of get doordash okay so dash along the way has been there for i'm going to say at least two years uh this these are not new features so tony is lying um, Tony is pretending, and I saw uh, Zach drives fast and Kim's side money plans were talking about this too. Like, these aren't new features. What is this guy even talking about? So he's just he's just lying, assuming that most of the people that watch this will be ignorant of his actual operations. Orders yeah. along the way. Kill the downtime. Kill the downtime. And then finally, safe dash location sharing, which uh, as the name implies, yeah. you know, sort of helps you uh, share your location. And you know, I just... Also not new. Uh, that's that's like a year ago. I wrote that it was a sham then. It's a sham now, but they still want to brag about something. The fact is they don't do anything for dashers ever. So what else can they do? Like they're caught with their pants down. So they're like, hey, they tell a marketing assistant. I used to be in the corporate world and they tell a marketing assistant, I want you to get me a list of every good thing we've ever done for dashers because I'm going to roll it out there and say it's new. And they go, okay, boss. So there you go. That's the truth of the corporate world. Somebody tell me I'm wrong. I beg you. Please, please tell me that I'm reading this wrong and some, there's another interpretation. There isn't. I just wanted to kind of, we'll, we'll kind of go through each of them sure. at some point, I'm sure in this interview today, but just lay those out at the start. And uh, which one, I'm not gonna make you pick a favorite, but which one kind of when you saw that feature or when you sort of saw the team working on it, or maybe one or two of them or your ideas, uh, which resonated with you the most? Well, they all resonated, but I think, um, you know, and each one of them has a history of their own. Um, and, and that's usually how these products work. I mean, when he gets to the nuts and bolts, I'll slow this stuff down, but this is just all bantering bullshit. We, uh, you know, start by doing the activities ourselves. And, and we have a program actually at DoorDash called WeDash where every month um, and, and every quarter and every year, everyone in the company, including myself, you know, performs deliveries. And we had something like nine. Okay, this is, this is number one, purely performative. Number two, if you read the job boards like Indeed or something about DoorDash employees and their feedback on dashing, you will see that the DoorDash employees are not into Tony's vision of dashing. Do some research for yourself on the internet. You're going to see that Dirty Ash employees don't want anything to do with hopping in their car and delivering happy meals. So Tony's lying again. But, you know, this is all for show. That's what the gig economy is. It's all for show. 99.9% of everyone last year in 2022, the deliveries at DoorDash. And oh, wow. so it kind of starts there and we kind of, you know, make hypotheses. I mean, we obviously report the bugs and things mm -hmm. like that, but we start creating hypotheses around what are the areas of problems that we should be tackling. Yeah. We mm -hmm. actually bet some of that with a Dasher community council that mm -hmm. we launched such a lie. They started a Dasher community council years and years ago. They, they used to uh, fly them out for a meeting or something, but I think even that was too expensive and they didn't listen to him anyway. So now there's allegedly some council of bullshit that you can be on that that's worth nothing and does nothing and has never done anything. Uh, another more, more corporate whitewashing, more window dressing. Four years ago in 2019, where, you know, we have a group of dashers in the US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand that pretty much, um, you know, apply for this role and really are stewards of the community. And we kind of get their take on, hey, are these the biggest problems to work on? And then we go to work. And, you know, in, in, in some of the announcements that you talked about, God, this guy's a all of them are important in, the, in their own right. This earned by time, um, you know, feature has been something that we've been thinking about for. Okay. Earned by time. What is earned by time? Let's, I'm going to break down earned by time for you really fast. Earned by time came on last year after uh, the Bureau of Labor announced that 
that they were looking into the gig economy in total because of deceptive business practices and they weren't sure about this independent contractor category and what should the what should the the rules be um there could be a ruling again this october that that changes some things uh, but the uh idea of going to hourly was clearly a response to the potential of legislation that would push for hourly work. So, so DoorDash, you know, they got the Bush doctrine down there. They are very, very, very smart people. They did a preemptive strike. What did they do? They put out work hourly. Well, isn't that great? So how did that work? Well, if you, if you watch the gig tubers, like I do, um, there's been millions of tests and people think that there is probably a scenario that somebody might benefit more from working hourly than working uh, by the individual uh, per order option. Um, nobody seems to really find it, but in theory it could be there. So when DoorDash put out the hourly, it was obvious to everybody that had a brain that they wouldn't have put it out if it wasn't going to pay less then the more risky option, because humans are risk averse, the more risky option, the more gamblified option of, of wage discrimination is work for order. The less gamblified version with less uncertainty, but lower return, that's human psychology. You learn about that in business school and psychology everywhere, right? That humans are risk averse. And so... So if you want to, if you want to, you know, connect with humans, give them less risky alternatives and they'll choose that over a higher return. That's just a fact. That's how psychology works. So DoorDash knows this stuff and they're using it against you. That's what this work by how is. So they're preventing, presenting their scam as more innovation. A few years now. And it's because, you know, one of the hardest challenges about a platform like the DoorDash platform is we have people who come from very different needs. You know, we've had over 30. Nobody comes from a different need for employment. The need for employment is employment and wages. That's the need. Um, DoorDash tries to obscure everything but the fact that uh, this is work that needs to be compensated fairly, that needs to be distributed fairly, that needs to be paid fairly, and that needs to be safe. Okay. This is heinous. 15 million dashers in our lifetime who generated or earned over $35 billion, yeah. you know, since inception. So he says, DoorDash, uh, this is a great debate. I'm enjoying it, Tony. DoorDash reports uh, their entire financial report, their annual 10K and all their quarterly reports as net income after they subtract the expense, uh, the total cost of dashers, the all-in cost of dashers, as they say in the financial report. So when Tony tells you that they've pa pay us, paid out X number of billions of dollars in wages, or he tells you anything about dashers, realize that that is highly uh, hidden information. They won't give it to the government. They won't give it to reporters. They won't give it to academics. They won't give it to anybody. So um, what he's saying at the very best is unproven and at worst is probably just a bald face lie. And, but you know, 90% of them dash fewer than 10 hours a week. Mm -hmm. And you know, the average is, you know, even less than four hours a week. And so you have a small portion of dashers that sometimes you know see this as more of a full-time opportunity, but the vast majority yeah. kind of come for sometimes 30 minutes a dash, yeah. sometimes up to 10 hours a week. And so it is tough to solve for every single particular yeah. use case. Okay. So what is this? This is called labor laundering. This is the greatest thing since sliced bread for the corporate world. Uh, a United States worker can work, can make up to $600 gross before DoorDash and that worker have to report that income to the IRS and before that's that's tracked. And even then, I don't think any of us really understand how the gig economy is counted in U.S. labor statistics and economics and all that kind of stuff. So uh, the fact that they have many fractionalized workers allows them to abuse those workers even worse allows the, them to pay those workers even worse and gives those workers less leverage, less knowledge, less information to even be able to defend themselves. So DoorDash thrives on inexperienced and unsuccessful and money losing app slaves, right? And they do this by telling people that there are many reasons to work and that, you know, 
five pennies is better than no pennies at all, which may or may not be true. But work is not about getting something that's better than nothing at all. Work is about work. And there are minimum work standards for that reason. We don't allow corporations to enslave people and make them work 20 hours a day. We have worker protections that came in. Uh, now, that's when the gig economy came in, there's no rules. So there are no worker protections. And when people try to do them, um, they're not successful because it's a game world. But you will hear people like the rideshare hustler that I talked to today. You'll see Pedro. You'll see many people that experiment or or regularly uh, Uber Lyft Phoenix regularly work 60, 70, 80 hours a week driving. It's not safe. It's not humane. It's not economically or environmentally viable. Uh, it's it's a human horror. But one of the things we've heard is that there's kind of two um, modes, one of which is dashers kind of feel like they understand how our platform works. They like the idea of assessing which orders are better for them versus which orders are not as good for them. And so they like to earn, you know, by each offer. And especially now that we're getting into grocery deliveries and in-store shopping and package returns and all different types of tasks, even beyond restaurant delivery, they like that choice. Yeah. On the other side, some people get overwhelmed by that choice and they dislike the kind of variance and the, oh, sometimes it's a high paying offer. Sometimes it's a lesser paying offer. Sometimes there's a tip involved with the order. Sometimes there isn't a tip. There's a lot of variables I have to keep in track. Can you just actually, you know, simplify it for me and give me the consistency of earnings that I expect for the limited time that I do this? Yeah. And that earn by time feature that we just announced, that's where it comes from. But it came from years of hearing this feedback and trying to actually, you know, get to, frankly, a certain scale of business where we can actually reliably and predictably offer that and then actually ship it. Did you hear what he just said? Reliably and predictably offer that. Reliably and predictably. DoorDash sets targets for what each dasher will earn over a given period of time. There is no independence. DoorDash controls both the supply and the demand for drivers at all times. They have 13 million. Tony just told you they have people that do from 30 minutes a week to 10 hours a week, that's that's their sweet spot. And then you've got other people, you know, the full timers, which he claims to respect, but he doesn't because he doesn't want those people at all. He doesn't make as much money off those people. He's, they're not as exploitable. They're not as good for labor laundering, obscuring the sources of labor and, and what it does. Imagine the amount of labor laundering that, that, that DoorDash is doing around the world. In a very responsible way. Um, so you guys were, I think, you know, really the first company, yeah. I think it's pretty innovative uh, to launch this, um, you know, sort of earn by time offering, you know, now available as an option really to dashers everywhere. Do you think that there is a specific type of dasher or type of person maybe that this is right for? I'm thinking like yeah. in my mind, like new drivers, new dashers, hey, you know, you just kind of want to learn more about the system, how it works. Maybe you're not as concerned with maximizing your earnings. Is there another? Okay. So this one, this one, I'm going to be critical of Harry. Maybe you're not as concerned about maximizing your earnings. There is nobody that's doing DoorDash that doesn't want to maximize their earnings. Uh, this is very disingenuous. They're treating us like we're stupid and ignorant. Um, we work for money. We don't work because we like delivering packages. That is insulting and absurd. Kind of profile that you had in mind, or who's this kind of product uh, you know the best fit for when you're designing? It? Yeah, I mean, it, when we first started, it was actually exactly what yeah. you know, I think our early hypothesis was kind of very similar to you know the setup of the question, which was for dashers who are maybe less experienced, right? Whether yeah. they're new dashers or just dashers who are infrequent and don't come onto the platform a lot, but when they do come on, they do expect to see the reliability and the consistency of those earnings. That was kind of the first take. As we started talking to more and more dashers, however, there are dashers because they come kind of come in and oh. out of the platform. It's not like they come in and then they leave; they never come back. Mm -hmm. There are dashers who've been with us for years who actually gave us feedback that said, you know, actually, that's not so bad. Yeah. Because I think one of the things we've learned kind of the through line through 10 years of doing this and, you know, having seen over 13 million dashers, both the, the stories as well as the data, what it would suggest is that everyone is looking for some goal. Mm -hmm. they're, they're coming to the platform for some goal. The goal could be money to save money for a project yeah. school. It could be to buy a particular uh, money um, discretionary mm -hmm. um, activity go on a trip. Yeah. Um, it could be to get a gift. It could be to, be, uh, you know, any near term needs for housing or other types mm -hmm. of. Um, activities. And as a result, it wasn't just new dashers or lesser experienced dashers who wanted the reliability or the consistency of the audience. Yeah. It was actually a lot of, there's a large contingency. And the way we thought about it was when you have- It's a perceived lessening of risk with lower return. That's what it is. This is, I'm going to give it to you in the economic terms. What Tony is offering you is perceived lowering of your risk, not really, but perceived and a guaranteed lower return. Thanks, Tony. Great now, job. when we're now responsible for so many dashers, as well as 
um, you know, we recognize we're not maybe the main thing for them, but that the fact that we can be a place for them to reduce their financial stress and burden, we have to offer the, the maximal choice. Yeah. If he cared about reducing financial stress and burden, he would offer fair wages and he would offer employment and he would offer corporate uh, corporate resources. He would offer training, training. He would offer support. Um, DoorDash has money. Anything that they don't offer is what they don't want you to have. That's the answer. And that means for certain dashers who love, you know, doing the analysis and figuring out every single order. Yeah. That's awesome. We got to keep that for, for, for others. Who that's a lie. You cannot anal analyze it. Okay. I pulled my own headphones out. You can't hold on. You're driving me crazy, Tony. You cannot analyze it. Every offer is, is, is includes obfuscated critical material information. The every offer from DoorDash is an unsolvable equation. Tony is lying. He is committing intentional fraud with every contract. Maybe don't have the time or, or maybe don't have the desire to, to do that. We, need, we do need a solution. Yeah. Well, I think that's what we've seen in the Dasher community with the sort of, you know, I know you guys have been testing the earn by time and a lot of Dashers out there sort of thinking, all right, comparing earn by offer, earn by time, you know, there's peak pay, right? There's a lot of factors that go into it. And I guess the nice thing, you know, I guess to give you guys some credit, um, you guys are kind of putting your money where your mouth is and saying, hey, we have two options without forcing anyone into either option. Uh, okay. No, they're not putting their money with that. Just, Harry's giving him too much credit here. I still appreciate you getting him on the record, Harry, but that's too much credit for, for a liar. I think that's one thing that, you know, sometimes it feels like, you know, working in the gig economy, there can be strings attached. Yes. You know, we're going to give you this, but we're going to take this or we're going to lower this. So in your mind, what, is there any downside? What expectations should Dashers? In his mind? In his mind? Uh, Okay have here with the earn um earn by time is there like what's not great about it well there's i mean it, in fact i mean we've been thinking about this idea yeah. for for years now and it's the implementation detail mm -hmm. that matters because our, one of our design principles was that you know the earnings have to be roughly the same yeah you know for, for so that roughly that, uh, no doubt wait a minute if it wasn't a rigged game how could you make the earnings roughly the same see there's there's again your hint you are you think you're independent you're not they created this to manipulate you again they they have they have obscured contracts you can't make a rational decision and they control both the supply and the demand for labor come on put it together people give up the ghost gig tubers you are not independent you will never be independent tony Su and doordash are a scam this is awful this is great and awful Asher is advantaged or disadvantaged depending on which choice they got it. So is that the goal? That is whole, or about, the same. about the same, you know, in, in either mode. But, but that takes iteration, and especially as we're introducing more modes of dashing, whether it's grocery shopping, retail delivery, you know, package returns, etc. Um, and as a result of that, um, it took us some time and iterating and trialing before actually rolling it out. Yeah. And so, and, and also, you know, you know, back to the the previous question around, you know, who's this for? Whether it's for you know lesser experienced dashers or newer dashers. It also took us time to learn that actually it was for a lot of people. Yeah. It wasn't something we should just target one segment. And as a result, you know, we, we took our time to make sure that we can roll out responsibly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think one thing that, you know, we've seen and heard from Dashers when it comes to... What is this targeting? What is this targeting work? I mean, again, what, so this is called algorithmic wage discrimination. This isn't called fair pay. This is called algorithmic wage discrimination that they're offering to target you with. Thanks, Tony earn my time. I guess if I was going to point out a complaint, it might be right that it's for active time, right? From the time that you accept an order to the time that you go. So if you're sitting there. Active time, the time you're moving in that little teeny window. So they want to pay you for fractional hours of work while you sit in your car baking in the sun, turning down bad offers. Great. You know, not busy, never getting an order. You're not necessarily being uh, paid for that. So talk a little bit about that, because I know that might come with some strings attached, right? If uh, DoorDash had to pay for that time. Too. Yeah. So I mean, our goal is always to keep people busy when mm -hmm. they want to be busy, right? Obviously, there's times that people don't want. Okay. Nobody wants to be busy. People want to be paid, paid, Tony, paid, 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 not busy, not delivering packages, paid. Want to do certain orders or don't want to deliver in certain areas. And we obviously offer the choice to, to reject those orders. And for us, you know, it's our job is to minimize, mm -hmm. um, you know, any wasted effort, maximize the efficiency, you know, for the entire system, right? DoorDash only works if it works for every single participant. And I'm not just talking about dashers now, you know, I'm talking about consumers, mm -hmm. I'm talking about merchants. DoorDash doesn't work for anybody except for Tony Sue and the rest of the ghouls in the gig economy corporate cabal. That's disgusting, man. What a ghoul. And so we run this pretty complicated system where on every single order, literally, you know, we have at least three people involved, right? There's a consumer yeah. who has to place an order, a merchant who's obviously preparing the order, and then obviously a dasher who's doing um, the fulfillment. And, and so that's the orchestration. And the goal is to make sure that there's zero waste of time. Yeah. Got it. Because not because they value anybody's time, but because 
that's where they make their money is in that time period from the pickup to the drop off that DoorDash cares about. That's the time he's talking about. He's not talking about wasting your eight hours or 12 hours sitting in a car uh, per day, making less than $10 an hour after expenses. That's not what he's talking about. Um, I mean, I think I definitely like that sort of utilization component, right? Keeping keeping dashers busy. And, you know, you talked to, you know, some of the numbers I think you guys have shared around this announcement were pretty interesting. 13 million mm -hmm. dashers. Um, can you talk a little bit about sort of the, I guess, the ebbs and flows of, you know, the dashers out? Okay, so, so now I'm seeing, he's saying 13 million dashers for all time. Um, I thought it was represented as 13, 13 million current dashers. I'm not sure. That, again, these numbers are coming out of the mouth of a stone cold liar and 13 million is a pretty damn round number, isn't it? I, I would not believe him out there yep. right now. You know, one of the complaints we've heard from dashers is that, you know, maybe sometimes there's like an oversupply of dashers, right? Because, you know, I think there's something there is by definition an oversupply of dashers. There's 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 millions and millions more dashers than are ever required an inherent tension, right? As a dasher, I kind of want to be paid as much as possible on an individual order, the biggest tip as possible. But, you know, over time, if customers have to pay a lot, right, that's going to cost them maybe less orders. So how do you kind of connect like what I care about as an individual to, you know, sort of the company's, you know, bottom line, the company's overall? Well, I, I can give you the answer to that easily. DoorDash makes money off the total transaction. Every penny that goes to a dasher decreases their demand. So every penny that goes to the all-in cost of a dasher hurts DoorDash. So every sale every transaction they don't sell anything every transaction that doordash makes they want to minimize the amount paid to the dasher all-in cost you can't win you cannot win that's not the way the game is played um anything else is a is a misrepresentation and a lie very simple all i'm um, you know kind of keeping you know, keeping dashers busy like is there a metric you think about or how do you think about like you know it's one thing to say like we should keep dashers busy but like is there like a number or you know what i mean yeah well, that's oh is there a um, number fun and challenging about running a platform where our goal is to make it work for everyone yes you know that's a lie you do not make it work for dashers dashers merchants and consumers and nor does it work for consumers who are gouged for for limited quality food so it, I wish it could be sometimes just one metric. Honestly, it'd be a much easier yeah. business to run, to be candid with you. Um, but we have to watch all of the yeah. parts, right? And I totally hear you loud and clear. I mean, I've been a part of dashing myself yeah. where, you know, I no, he has not. Tony door, Tony DoorDash Chu has never subjected himself to being an app slave. I was sitting there in their own order. Delivering a package and being an app slave are not the same thing. Delivering a package and being run by corporate AI are not the same thing. That's why nobody in the community that are consumers or anything else understand what it's like to be a dasher. Because being a dasher is very, very different than just riding around in your car listening to your music. It's much more dangerous. It's much more stressful. It's much more frustrating. It's much more miserable. It's a lot of things. It's not a lot of fun. For orders, right? That means we got it wrong yeah. on the supply and demand matching. And that means we supply and demand matching. If you hear somebody talking about supply and demand matching, they're running a scam. We got to go here in that particular area, in that particular time, in that particular neighborhood, in that particular merchant mm -hmm. area, right? Or we got the wait times wrong, yeah. you know, for a particular, um, you know, restaurant or... Got the wait times wrong. See how they're orchestrating every single second of the day. So when they make dashers wait somewhere, they're doing that on purpose. They're sending you to wait because your time isn't valuable, okay? His time's valuable, but they want you there waiting for the hot and ready meal. They don't want the hot and ready meal waiting for you. You're the law. You're the one to lose the money. They're not losing money in time. You're losing money in time. For a particular shopping experience where it took a lot longer than than you know was expected, or that an item was even available, mm -hmm. right? And and there's a very difficult kind of um, substitution experience required for both the dasher as well as the consumer. And so these are all the things we have to hear. You know, I, I wish it were just one metric. I, I sincerely do sometimes, but but that's that's really but that's not good enough, mm -hmm. right? If we want to build a business where we can make all of the local businesses successful, bring them incremental yeah. sales, and empower them by giving them tools to build their own digital products and give work opportunities mm -hmm. and make it convenient for, for consumers and affordable for consumers where we can build it sustainably over a long period of time. It can't just be one metric. Yeah. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about the WeDash program you mentioned. Sure. You said 99.9. Last year, 2022,000. I'm guessing that's what thousands or tens of thousands of. Yeah, I mean, I, exactly. Uh, of, of DoorDash employees mm -hmm. out there doing deliveries. I mean, yeah. I, I really believe it's important to, I mean, sincerely, um, understand what we're doing. Yeah. Well, I, I kind of really like that because, you know, a few of the, the comments you made, I, it sort of made me think like you've been out there dashing, right? You know, certain restaurants maybe, you know, want to avoid, <laughs> not going to name any names, right? Certain restaurants are a little slower, certain types of. So, yeah, right. Um, I mean, if their if their entire company is built upon uh, exploiting app slaves, it'd probably be good to know how the app slaves actually work so you can exploit them. This isn't this isn't teamwork. This is this is understanding their product, which is you, your labor, your slavery.
And they want to sell you off to other things. They want to fractionalize you so that you'll never have any accountability from anybody you work for. You'll just be on your own out there on the street cruising around until you ruin your car or your body or whatever else or your community. Orders, you know, you know, certain ones where you maybe have to do shopping, you know, or um, compared to just that's, that's off, like, so. but even on that one, Harry, though, like, but it's not even about the avoidance of those restaurants, mm -hmm. right? It's about better understanding the why and how to deal with it, yeah. right? It, it's almost like if you think about how a city works, that's the way I think about how our business works. We have to be a digital representation of everything that happens physically. And sometimes in so See what he just said? A digital representation of everything that happens physically. That's a simulation. It's not real time. That's not possible. It's a simulation. Software. We like to just talk about writing beautiful software that yeah. just does, you know, the job and we, you know, forget about the edge cases or, or just take a small amount of customization on the edge case. Beautiful software that exploit humans beings. That's just, that's touching Tony. Cases in the physical world, everything is an edge case. So you mm -hmm. can't just say, oh, there's that restaurant that takes forever or that um, store that has stockouts all the time. And therefore we should just ignore them. Yeah. No, they're part of our communities, right? They're part of, they represent the personality. Well, that's because Tony doesn't bear any of the, of the business risk. You, the dashers, the app slaves bear all the business risk. That's why he doesn't care about it. If it cost him money, he'd care about it a whole hell of a lot. You know, maybe that restaurant that has a long wait time is just really popular. Yeah. Or you know what? Maybe they just had a bad day and two staff. Yeah, he's so understanding with your time. He's a generous guy. Members decided not to show up. Yeah. And it doesn't mean that they're not a part of the well, community. I guess that's sort of the challenge, right? Because as a dasher, you do kind of think about like, if I have to wait, you know, that's kind of why I like to earn my time. Because now if I'm waiting, I totally, you don't have to think, think about it. it. You don't have to that, right? In the past, you know, sometimes we hear this complaint from gig workers, right? It's like, oh, it'd be so nice if I could just go out, deliver, you know, and you're totally about all these things. But really, you know, like my whole business is kind of about like, let's figure out which restaurants to avoid, right? Because if you avoid those, you will literally make more money, right? By, you know, avoiding. Yeah. And that means we didn't build a good enough product, right? Yeah. If we built a product where it feels like some participant mm -hmm. should feel like they must avoid another participant, right? Remember, it takes yeah. three to tango here, right? <laughs> Consumers, merchants, and dashers. And, and, and we are all part of the same orchestration on the same world. We're all part of the same team, right? And so if we build a product as a platform mm -hmm. where one of those participants, you know, has, you know, some negative incentive with another, we have to solve it. Yeah. We can't just. You are not part of any team. And he just told you the equation for dancer, for dashers. There's a negative incentive for DoorDash to pay you. He's a terrible liar for a professional liar. Oh, you know what? That's an edge case. I think one thing a lot of dashers forget too is that this is a three-sided marketplace. Yeah. I mean, so if you were talking, you know, if you, were, if you had a dasher, you had lots of dashers that you were talking to, for example, and you could kind of, well, like, what do you think dashers don't understand about either customers? It's a rigged marketplace, not a three-sided marketplace. It's a polluted marketplace, not a three-sided marketplace. It's a gamblified marketplace, not a three-sided marketplace. It's a fraudulent marketplace, not a legitimate marketplace or merchants, right? Because I think it's easy, you know, like they're kind of, it's almost like behind the scene, you know what I mean? Yeah. Go, you pick up, yeah. you drop off, like, oh, you know, since the pandemic, you don't even see your customer's face anymore, yeah. right? I mean, that's good and bad, right? Um, it's not as personal, right? So what would you tell dashers like, hey, what do you not think about? What should you know or consider about the merchants or the customer? What I would tell dashers or frankly, merchants or even consumers is that it does take three audiences to make one order successful yeah. every single time, right? And we as a platform have to solve for all of us and, and to make sure that, you know, sustainably we can keep growing the GDPs of these cities, which is great for jobs, which is great for, you know, um, earnings, which is great for sales for local businesses and, and it's great for consumers. And so we have to think about all of those parts, but I totally get it. Look, it's out of sight, out of mind. Wow. Did you hear what this asshole just said? He wants to grow the GDP of your cities, which means he gets a percentage of the GDP of your city. That's, that's what he's saying. He wants a percentage of all transactions in the city because DoorDash is the infrastructure for every local community, as it says in their state, in their mission statement. They're a technology company. They're not into delivery. They don't do delivery. App slaves do delivery and they don't know you. You're not part of their records. You're not part of their financial statement. You don't get to talk to them if you need support. Customers don't get to talk to them to, to get support. They don't know you. DoorDash doesn't know you, but they want to grow your your local gdp they want to they want to they want to grow your local domestic product they want to grow your revenue locally okay sure they do what did he say again did, did he say gdp fine right and i've been on right and we as a platform have to solve for all of us and, and to make sure that you know sustainably we can keep growing the gdps of these cities which is great for okay gross domestic product is like a national economic term i don't think uh cities necessarily cal uh, calculate a gdp um, if i'm wrong somebody can correct me on that i've never thought of a city having gdp i think tony is completely full of shit here jobs which is great for you know um earnings which is great for sales for local businesses and, and it's great for consumers and so we have to think about all those parts but i totally get it look it's out of sight out of mind right and i've been on deliveries where oh my gosh why did the app take me to somewhere so far or why did i have to wait 20 minutes in line you know I, i've been a part of those really tough dashes and that's a problem you gotta go <laughs> 
those tough dashes where dashers lose money and work for DoorDash for free or at a loss and are treated as slaves and as expendable human fuel. He means those. Those is what he's talking about. That's what he's talking about. Fix, right? We're going to go fix it. Yeah, right. And this idea of. Have they, have they fixed it? Is there anybody that has ever done a dash that would say that that's fixed? I, I, I cannot believe that there would be. Incrementally solving each one of these edge cases to smoothing them. That's, you know, really what it took candidly to get a product like Burn by Time even shipped. That's why it, we couldn't just ship it in, you know, a month or two. Yeah. I mean, it took literally years of, you know, working every one of these edge cases where it got polished enough. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so look at this. If Earn by Time was legitimate, they would just put a clock out and they go Earn by Time. It took them years to engineer it into corporate AI that came out equivalent to their rigged Earn by Order platform. Are you getting this? Are you getting how far this is from the real world? Are you? Please tell me that you are. That's in this is the greatest interview Tony has ever done because he is proving to you that everything you've ever been told about DoorDash is a lie. Or we felt like we could roll it out. Got it. So what are some of the other, I guess, uh, you know, things you've discovered while we dashing either from you or, you know, maybe oh, yeah. that have you know, now been implemented in this uh, product rollout? There's a Slack channel devoted to <laughs> all of the we dashes by anyone okay. in the company. And I mean, it is just hit after hit after hit of app bugs around, you know, just how difficult the app is, you know, sometimes to use. We, we have to do a better. Well, isn't that great? When they use the app themselves, they learn that the Dasher app is a giant piece of shit. We already knew that too, but that's great, Tony. Really fine work. Way to do the 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 quality uh, analysis. You're a QA. You're a judo. You're your black belt man. Good job, Tony. Good job there. Whether it, it, um, so we're working on that. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, challenges with some of the things we've actually kind of discussed, whether it's getting the wait times wrong, yeah. getting the order to supply ratios off, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, 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 sitting around waiting yeah. for no orders problem. That order to supply ratios off. What does that mean? Does that mean they control the orders that come in and what the supply is? Does that mean that they can tune down the restaurants and cut down the number of deliveries or tune up the restaurants and increase the number of deliveries? Yeah, it does. That's what it means. Does that mean they can make every dasher in the system take longer to deliver rather than a shorter time to deliver by sending them just 10% further? That's what it means. Are you getting this? Are you getting what Tony's telling you? That they created a world for you in which you're used by them. You talked about um, or just realizing, you know, hey, why are we um, dashing from a particular store that that seems to be either closed or super busy when there's another store that's literally selling the exact same things? That so uh, DoorDash, for example, will send dashers to a closed store, even knowing it's closed, because they don't care about your time and you making money. They want a human verification that the store is closed. So they'll sell them dashers to a closed store just to get a view. Now, does that dasher actually have the chance of making a delivery in that independent contract? Of course not. There is no store order. The store is closed, but they'll waste your time to get you to confirm it. Great, right? Thanks, Tony. That's actually open and available. Yeah. I mean, there, there's literally all sorts of things that I know. I don't think there's a single dash. And I By the way, most of this is available on the DoorDash engineering blog on YouTube. If you watch close enough and watch enough tech talks, they'll tell you how they do it. Most of it. They're very secretive about the Dasher part and about Dasher income and stuff, but they talk about their AI. They're very impressed with themselves. They're very smart. I've done almost a thousand where I haven't learned something. Mm. And, and again, because if you think about what DoorDash, the ultimate problem that we're solving, we're trying to build a digital catalog for the physical world. So digital catalog for the physical world, the digital catalog of what app slaves, you're the digital catalog. You are the, they're going to fractionalize you and sell you off to the physical world. Tony just told you, God, this is horrible. This is like a this is like a living nightmare, except we're watching the the evil genius behind it, like tell you the quiet part out loud. We are always going to find challenges, yeah. right? And it's not we're not criticizing the the, the the store that's taking longer or the store that has a stock app. We're trying to help them. We're trying to understand, like, okay, well, yeah, because you don't bear the business risk. The dashers, the the labor bears the business risk, dude. It, it's all good. It's all good to DoorDash. Maybe we predicted incorrectly. You know something about your store. If we did a better job doing that, then the dasher may two million predictions a second. They don't like to predict incorrectly. They want to predict accurately. We would not have waited, you know, or that, you know, the inventory would have been. Yeah. What do you think is the number one uh, challenge that uh, dashers face out on the road today? I always not dying and wrecking their car. That's number one. Don't die. Don't wreck your car. Keep your eyes on the road. Don't 
freaking use your cell phone and drive. Don't kill people. Don't kill yourself. I think, you know, challenges for dashers are whenever there is a mismatch um, in expectations. And, and and that's why it's hard to just say, oh, there's a challenge for the new dasher, which is the exact same challenge for the, you know, super experienced dasher, right? That's, that's not usually the same, right? There's some commonalities. I talked about app stability, app usage. Yeah, sure. Those Oh, I like that he uses app terms. I have app terms too. App app colonization, app slavery, app risk, app app. Uh, what what else do I have? Well, I got a whole bunch of app terms, except they actually describe what apps are. They they don't uh, labor laundering. That's another one. Doesn't doesn't have app as a prefix. But um, I like the thoughts, Tony. Those are, those are common. Nobody likes to wait, you know, forever. I think we talked about some of the like the the, the top pain points, and but I don't think that's actually good enough in terms of understanding dashers because you know dashers at the end i mean sometimes we just you know sit back after um a while of you know running this business and just look at the numbers dashers are people right the dashers come they're teachers they're parents they are entrepreneurs he's very insightful dashers are actually people right they're people who ended up founding their own i think he understands us you know media companies like yourself and 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 i think it's not good enough candidly to just say oh well you know what if we just solve these top five pain points we're done yeah. that's not good enough. We, we we actually have to understand did we help you solve your goal? Yeah. And if your goal was to achieve X and we didn't do it in whatever, whatever X was, by the way, it's not always a money thing. Um, if you're a dasher, it's a money thing. You don't dash for stars and programs. You dash for money. More money is better than less money, Tony. Less time is ready for less time is better than more time. Rights, human rights. Darn right. Jay Stokes. Uh, Tony's insane. Tony is completely insane. Hey, a red chair hustler. This um, is, this is well, great to go stuff, to that. Yeah. And so that's how I think about our relationship with dashers. Yeah. I mean, I think we've surveyed, you know, thousands of drivers every year for almost 10 years, not quite as long as you guys have been yeah. nine years and, you know, talk to thousands of drivers. And I feel like the two themes that come up over and over earnings and flexibility, I mean, earnings, you know, I, I think everyone wants to make more yeah. money, right? Not necessarily just gig workers, you know, sure. people in every job, every industry yeah. and then flexibility. I think the announcement that you guys have made today mm -hmm. really does a lot to address uh, the flexibility. And I mean, I guess on the earnings component, like how do you think about earnings in terms of dashers? You know, I think we've seen, you know, the earn by time, you know, pilot, for example, you know, we've seen 10, 12, 16, you know, plus peak pay per hour, right? We've seen, you know, different amounts and obviously you know certain cities you know you're gonna pay a little bit more so so to recap for people that may have just jumped in uh jay stokes and rideshare hustler um anybody else that's just popping in and and starting to watch here uh as we get towards seven o'clock again at the bottom of the hour 7 30 we're going to be rating uh echoplex media for the down ballot podcast uh, that's always a good time so stick with us there if you're tuning in what we're hearing is that tony tony Shu is confirming that Everything about DoorDash is rigged um, from the, the hourly pay it took them years to develop because they need to develop it uh, to be on par with the rigged aspect of per order. Uh, he's explaining to you how every single aspect of the world of DoorDash is, uh, is part of their control plan. Are than others, but I guess in your mind, like what? You know, how do you think about like, is there a number you think dashers should earn or, you know, how busy they should stay? Like, how do you think about how much they should be paid? Yeah. I mean, one of the things I'm always looking at is, you know, well, well for, first to your point, you know, this should be interesting. I really don't know what he's going to say. Are, are, are the numbers um, actually fair to the job that's actually being asked, right? Because DoorDash today is is no, not like the DoorDash of 10 years ago where we were just restaurant delivery. Yeah. Some deliveries now are just structurally going to take longer. Mm -hmm. When you're shopping for a basket of 25 grocery items, that is going to take longer yeah. than going and getting up a pickup order from, you know, fast food mm -hmm. restaurant, right? And so, the first thing is, you know, we, we have to really make sure that it's fair to the task that is being asked, yeah. right? The second thing we look at is, you know, um, the supply and demand component such that we actually don't want to have a Torp. Hey, this, uh, this is great, man. You got to You got to You'll have to go back and, and watch back on this when we, uh, when it goes, cause Tony is just explaining to you how he rigs, how they rig everything in the world. Nothing is real. This is, this is really great stuff. Great interview. We'll find more as we go forward. Of an oversaturation, right? We we do not allow an unlimited supply of dashers to get out on the road, and that's intentional to protect dasher, right? Dasher. They do not. They control both the supply and demand for dashers at all times. I'm happy to say, you know, when we started the company, it was something closer to like 16 an hour nationwide. We're now closer to 24, 25 an hour nationwide, mm -hmm. right? And so it's moving in the right direction, I believe. And it, but 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 that's not good enough to to look at just that average. It's we have to look one click lower, in my opinion, which is. Is it right for the right task? And we don't always get those things right, mm -hmm. right? Maybe we misestimated, you know, some time or challenge candidly to get, you know, a particular activity done. Well, we got to go redo that.
We have to make it easier to do the tasks. That's the other thing we have to do. And we have to increase the matching opportunities in our system um, as we get into other categories. Matching opportunities. See, this is, this is the difference between dispatch and between computer AI. So in dispatch, the next thing that comes in, I'm going to give to Torp. Then the next thing that comes in, I'm going to give to Rideshare Hustler. Then the next thing that comes in, I'm going to give to Jay Stokes. Then the next thing that comes in, I'm going to give to Lady B. That's dispatching. What Tony is talking about is they take in all this information, they chew it all up, and then they arbitrage it out through little app slaves like us, DoorDashers, and then they sell it to somebody else at a higher price. They're not part of that middle thing, right? This is just arbitrage. This is buying something low and selling it high. And the guy in the middle doesn't matter. We're the guys that don't, we're the guy in the middle that doesn't matter. They don't, we're not part of their business ever. We're not on their financial statement. We have nothing to do with DoorDash. They don't care about us. So, uh, so what Tony is telling you, right, is that that they have to match. And again, we're going to do the math right here. Fifteen factorial. If I had fifteen drivers and fifteen restaurants, that is fifteen factorial. That's fifteen times fourteen times thirteen times twelve times eleven times ten times nine times eight seven six five four three two one. That's over a trillion combinations. Trillion combinations is the difference between me handing it out to Torp, Rideshare, Jay Stokes, and Lady B in order. That's the difference between corporate AI and a dispatching system. That's why you are being fooled. Every single one of you is being in a game. You're being rigged, whether you go hourly, whether you go per order, there's a target amount. They are chewing this stuff and they are serving it out to you. I noticed this when I dashed hours a day, you know, three weeks in a row during the pandemic that my numbers were uncannily, which I tracked them very uncannily similar. Like this can't be random. I can't be making, you know, 2240 average gross per hour every freaking day. That's just not random, right? And there was no dash per hour at the time. So I started to pick up on the fact that, that this is not, this is not random. There's no, there's no way this can be random. You also know that hotspots are not real, right? Hotspot is just, they want to move you, but you could be next to me and we'd get different hotspots. This is a simulation. Everything is fake. You're being fleeced. Okay, let's go. Um, other modes of transport beyond just, you know, a, a car. And, um, and so we're working on those things. You know, I, I don't think we always get it right, but you know, you have my commitment and, and, and frankly, you know, the team's commitment that, I mean, this is a core customer of ours. We do not view this as optimizing for just the consumer. We've always believed that. In fact, when we started the company, the very first product, the mm -hmm. very, very, very first product for consumers, merchants, and dashers that we built was the Dasher app. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it was, well, that makes absolutely no freaking difference whatsoever. Again, if, if he had anything real to offer you, would he be telling you that they made the Dasher app first? What the fuck do we care who that which they made first they made the dash wrap first because you're the slave they need the slaves first you can't freaking start a slave market without slaves jeepers creepers tony nice job wasn't it? we didn't even have an app for consumers we had a website where there's eight restaurants you know and, and a phone number for you to call that was how we started but but well, um, right because with eight restaurants you don't need corporate ai with eight restaurants, you just need some guys that want to learn the business so that they can create corporate ai and then fleece people all over the world by the billions and it's because we believe at the end of the day that it starts with actually bringing people what it is that they want to order. And obviously dashers are a huge component of that and getting that right first. Yeah. So I think, you know, one thing I noticed about the product announcement today, you know, especially on the consumer app, uh, I was, I was sort of loosely paying attention because I was waiting for the dashers. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Said, wow. There's all these different categories that are launching and there are, I think that is all lies, right? They're saving this stuff up and then rolling it out, you know, which has already been out for a year just because they're full of shit important uh, to dashers, right? Because yeah, typically DoorDash has been, you know, primarily food delivery. And I know over the past few years, you've done more on the convenience yeah. and grocery. And, you know, it seems like now, you know, what I see from the- Why? This is not, this is not brilliant. It was during the pandemic and we were all locked in and restaurants didn't have anywhere to eat and we couldn't go out. There's a reason food delivery was big. And then food delivery tailed off because there's no demand for that much food delivery when you're not in the pandemic. 85% of restaurants never had delivery options prior to the pandemic. 99% of real retailers never had delivery options uh, without before the pandemic. 99%. So wait a minute. From the history of the world till now, how did 15%, I mean, how did 85% of restaurants and 99% of retailers get by without app slaves? How did they do it? How did we survive? Just fine. And you know what? We didn't have a parasite like DoorDash crushing employment, destroying any chance at unionization and labor rights, and destroying any progress that's been made toward labor rights in the history of America. 
and the history of the world. This thing is the most awful in innovation to come along to humanity, maybe in history. And it's not a legitimate business. So let's let's kill the status quo bias. I don't care if it's here. It's here today. Enron was here once, wasn't it? And what was Enron? It was a freaking scam. What was what was the the FTX was here once, wasn't it? It was. And you could watch it on the on the financial channels and everybody tell you how much money you could make on FTX. Where is it now? It's gone. If you don't think that this motherfucker is twice as evil as either one of those, you are wrong. Those were nothing compared to app slavery and app colonization around the world. These guys, this bastard acquired during the pandemic uh, from Finland, the technology company that is uh, is called, uh, what is it? The, the, the Volt, W-O-L-T, except it, it's pronounced with a V in German, Volt app. So they acquired 26, uh, 23 additional countries, nations, to go with the four that they already had, which were Canada, the US, UK, and Australia. So they added 20, 24 more, 23 more, cheaper creepers, my math is killing me. So if they added that many more, uh, what do you think they're going to do to those? You know, they're paying people dollars a day in India, Uber is. And and they want to, uh, they'd love to have you making dollars a day to make no mistake about it. They will pay you as little as they can to enslave you forever. Um, it's the corporate psychopath at work. All right, let's keep going. Consumer side is all these different categories. Yeah. Um, and so talk about what that means for Dashers. Because yeah. I think most people think of DoorDash as food delivery yeah. and... Just a note, like you guys are going to see, again, this full thing. You're going to see them analyze it uh, in detail on the rideshare guide next week with Harry and Sergio. I'm playing it at like one and a half speed because I don't have time to deal with his bullshit. Neither do you. And and I don't want to take away from what these guys are doing. You should watch them yourself. I think, look, only 570 people in the world have viewed this video so far. So that's one of the reasons I'm doing this. I'm plugging the rideshare guy. I'm telling you, go watch their show. Watch this video. Watch it multiple times, please. Watch it multiple on their channel, not on my channel. You can watch, you can watch me. Watch it multiple times, please, because you are getting the truth. Harry doesn't have to call Tony to the carpet. Tony's hanging himself. Tony's saying the quiet parts out loud. Nice job, Tony. You know, should they expect to do, you know, food delivery mixed with a little grocery yeah. or are these separate categories? How do you think about the experience for Dashers with all these different categories? You guys are yeah, I mean, we named the company DoorDash intentionally, you know, knowing that, the, <laughs> yeah, knowing that we were a technology company from day one that started yeah. in restaurant delivery with the goal of building, um, you know, last mile services for every category. Yeah. And then over time, other types of services to help these uh, local businesses grow. I mean, that, that was all. Every category and every business. What a horror. Hey, Torp, I really like your uh, comment. I always enjoy talking with you. I always like, enjoy watching your channels. It's beyond me that Jeff isn't banging in the views, but he will, everybody needs to hear him. Okay, so number one, I'm not a gig tuber. Don't want to be a gig tuber. Have never made a penny off of any type of, of that kind of broadcasting. Um, I'd like to be a professional broadcaster when I grow up. That's great. Uh, but it's not going to be uh, on gig tube. So I am not doing this for views. I am doing this because this is part of the community I've been in watching you guys do the views. It was always my intention to support and teach and share with the gig tubers not to become a gig tuber. So that's number one. Number two, I'm a writer um, and I'm writing a really good book on full dash uh, called Full Dash Closure, Awakening to the Human Exploitation of DoorDash Singularity. And I hope every single one of you buy it because I would like to retire someday. So there are going to be ways that you'll be able to get your hands on this content. But yeah, to answer your question, Torp, that really hasn't been my goal. I'm happy to share the information because uh, all the gig tubers are the people that really reach the, uh, the labor, the app slaves, the potential victims of DoorDash and Uber and, and Lyft and, and Grubhub and others. And so you guys, uh, you all, you, you women and men, you people, um, have a lot to offer the world. And that's why I guess I get upset with Pedro and some others when I feel like they can do so much better. It's not that I dislike anybody because I don't. And it's not that I care if you have conservative politics, like my friend, the rideshare hustler, or if you're a lefty West coaster, or if you're, uh, if you're 
I don't care who you are. That doesn't matter. Like that's a scam too. That anybody in the world ever convinced us that we had to know our neighbor's politics and like them. That is just untrue. If you're a good neighbor, you don't need to know anybody's politics and they don't need to know yours. Just be a good neighbor. It's really much, it's, we'll get along much better this way. But the fact is DoorDash pits people against each other by gaslighting us, by using arbitrage, by ruining our local communities, by ruining our local businesses, by ruining people's cars, by clogging our roads with delivering Starbucks and McDonald's at preferred prices. Not at competitive prices with your local hamburger restaurant or your local uh, barista at predatory prices that they're going to put all the local economy out of, out of business. So when Tony talks about his Chinese restaurant owning mother, he is full of fucking shit. Tony is a piece of shit. He is the worst human being. He panders to you. Do not ever believe him. Yeah, being a gig tuber is dead. Don't be a gig tuber. Just be a truth teller. That's why I like Torp. Torp is wrong sometimes. I tell him he's wrong. He doesn't give a shit. He tells the truth. He'll go, yeah, I'm wrong sometimes. Then I learn and I do better. Tell me I'm wrong, Torp. Tell me I'm wrong. I didn't know this shit when I was door dashing. I didn't do 5,521 deliveries and research DoorDash in, in detail uh, while I was doing it. I knew there was a problem, but I didn't know until I quit quit dashing a year ago when my fan or when my timing belt and water pump blew up in Bloomington, Indiana and stranded me. And I said, well, I guess I better start my book because I'm out of work. And so I started my book and I never dashed again because I couldn't stomach it once I started researching the corporate AI. That's That's my story. Right. Why did I do so? So I am not putting anybody down for supporting themselves. What I am saying is I want you to have informed consent. If you log on to DoorDash, you need to know that this motherfucker is the biggest liar on the planet and act accordingly and defend yourself. Then I'm happy. If you know the truth and you go on DoorDash and you want to work 20 hours a day, that's cool. I just want you to know the truth. Don't tell me that you're counting stars and you're doing your AR rate and you hope if you expect more that you'll get fairies in your dreams and rewards in heaven. None of that shit's going to happen. That's that's gamification. That's gamblification. That's illusion. It's deception. It's delusion. It's a lot of things. But it's not reality. So just be an informed consumer. Um, the problem is, again, if DoorDash comes out into a legitimate company with integrity and with transparency, it can't function, nor can Uber, nor can anything else, right? They they have to depend upon deceiving us because if they don't deceive us, nobody's going to pick somebody up on New Jersey side, take them into, into central Manhattan, and then deadhead for two hours back to New Jersey with no ride because you're not even allowed to pick anybody. New. The only way anybody up in New York and take them to New Jersey. The only person, some, the only way somebody's going to take that shitty money losing ride is if I deceive them and don't tell them where they're going. The only way somebody's going to take somebody to a neighborhood they don't want to go to, whether it's a race or a location or a people, whatever, the only way you're going to get people to go where they don't want to go is don't tell them where they're going. You see how, you see the pattern? You see how Uber does it? It's a little bit less crazy than DoorDash because they actually have to pick up a physical human being, not just a bag of food or a, or a bag of dog food or, or some groceries, right? You got to carry humans. That's a lot more responsible. Uh, yeah. The tips and tricks are dead. I mean, that's the first thing I said in my book is like, this book is not about tips and tricks because there are no tips and tricks. I'll tell you the truth. Uh, chapter two, chapter two is a uh, open letter to dashers from me that tells you the truth from my heart. You can read that on Substack today. I've released uh, four chapters and the introduction prior to printing the book. So you get a preview. Go check it out. Um, the fact is that that people like Pedro, anybody talking about DoorDash features and releases and anything like that doesn't have anything to offer you. There's nothing to learn. We are all markets of one playing an AI that's beating our pants off. What Torp does uh, in, in his area of the world, which is Kentucky, has zero to do with what I did in Bloomington, which has zero to do with what uh, Rideshare Hustler is doing in Los Angeles. We, 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 are, we are anecdotes. That's what you get out of, out of corporate AI. You get anecdotes. You don't get any knowledge. Knowledge is impossible, 
right? Unless it, uh, unless you can calculate like a trillion combinations, and then please call me on the phone. I'd like to talk to you if you can if you can do fifteen factorial and figure out how to dispatch better than Tony Shu. Then let's talk. Let's keep going because I want to wrap this up by seven thirty. We're going to transfer over to our friends at, at Echoplex Media. Always the vision for the company. Well, you know, when I first did my orientation, when DoorDash used to do actual in-person orientations in Orange County, yes, nine years ago when I signed up to drive. Actual in-person orientation when they were teeny little company before the pandemic, right? Are they going to do in-person in orientations today? <laughs> yeah, 13 million. DoorDash, someone asked a question. Do you have to take the food to the door? And the guy said, it's in the name, DoorDash. Yes, you have to take the food to the door. I like that. I like that. But yeah, you're, you're totally right, though. We have, you know, 500,000 plus restaurants. Now over 100,000 um, non-restaurants or grocery stores. Yeah. In Torp. You nail it as usual. So here's why they do that. Here's why they change every day. And here's why every gig to be work is going to talk about a different feature. You know what chaos is? An unsolvable equation. That's what they're giving you, Torp. That's what they're giving all of us. And we're not smart enough to see it. We're, we, we don't see the big picture and they don't want us to see the big picture, right? The reason that Kim has some new feature that she talks about and Pedro has another thing that he talks, and then Zach talks about something and then Torp, you see something and then somebody else. The reason for that is that corporate AI self-tests. It, it's, it's creating features. It's moving things around. It's constantly changing in this chaos. So you, I can't even call Torp on the phone and go, hey man, here's what's happening on my Apple iPhone. What's happening on your, uh, on your phone that you're using to DoorDash? Cause there's like, we're not even looking at the same interface, man. We're not looking at the same interface. He's being, you know, he's being played with one version. I'm being played with another version. It's all a test. Everything, the computer's learning more and more. The computer's learning how to beat Torp's pants off. The computer's learning how to beat my pants off. Uh, the computer's learning if we don't play the game well and, and you know, we just don't accept anything and, and it realizes that we're probably not going to be a priority. I mean, here's one of the things you've heard about, uh, You've heard about people being deactivated. That's what they call it when corporate AI sends you a message and says you don't you don't have access to the app anymore. So they do that for any reason, for no reason, for some reason. We we don't know, but there's no accountability because DoorDash isn't real, and third party support isn't empowered. Uh, so when people get deactivated. There's, there's a reason for that. Number one, they may have broken one of the 10 million terms and conditions as Torp just talked about in his video. Man, if you haven't read the bullshit terms and conditions from the gig economy, you haven't seen, you haven't lived, man. You haven't lived until you've read the terms and conditions for the gig economy. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a laugh riot. If you're a lawyer or if you've worked uh, with legal documents for a long time, you will, you will laugh out loud because uh, there's a reason DoorDash's lead attorney made almost $17 million last year. What do you think that reason is? They're really good. Better than you. Better than me. <laughs> it's uh, like, this is the thing, right? As I was writing this book, I just kept calling my friends. Go, you will fucking believe this. You will not believe this. Like, again, like everything I found, you just uncovered another rocket. It's like, holy crap. This is the worst thing I've ever seen. Do you know that their their lead corporate or their lead government representative worked in the White House? Was a White House staffer? They're not playing small ball, man. DoorDash plays at the national government level. They're playing with heads of state. They're playing with dictators. They're playing with with billionaires. They're playing with people that want to task millions of people scalably with tasks that may or may not benefit them but definitely will control their consciousness and their mind and their work. Uh, I think DoorDash gets off on people doing it. Yes, this is, um, this is an evil corporation. This has been confirmed to me from the inside. Um, DoorDash does get off on torturing us. DoorDash is filled with people that do dark design for user interfaces. An ethical designer would not work for DoorDash. I'll say that again. An ethical systems designer or marketer or corporate person would not work for DoorDash. I would never work for DoorDash. Nobody with ethics would work for DoorDash. You might get rich, but you're selling slavery. You're, you're an evil motherfucker. So that's that's unfortunate, isn't it? Because um, there are people that will take the advantage of millions of people across the world, billions of people across the world, enslave people for the rest of, of time that humans are on this earth. They're setting up this system. Uh, it's a nuclear bomb. This is a social nuclear bomb. It makes consumers and the lower caste of, of labor that makes deliveries 
uh, makes them rivals. We see that. We see the gaslighting. We see the societal disarray. And the fact is, every single one of us on this broadcast is at the bottom. We're all at the bottom of society. Right? There is no middle class. There's there's the oligarchs and the rich people and the billionaires and there's us. If you got a billion dollars, call me. I could use some. I could use some uh, help on the project. But other than that, we're all the lower caste. We're all the lower class. So um, these divisions, whether we be gouged consumers or hapless app slaves, we're in the same boat. We're the DoorDash is destroying our community. Destroying our community. If the only thing I can say about DoorDash and the gig economy is kill it with fire. It's it. That's all. It can't be reformed. It can't be rehabbed. It can't be fixed. And Tony's telling you it can't be fixed because they spend years making this rigged system to manipulate, coerce, and enslave you. You think it can be turned off? You think they can flip a switch and change one of the features, shift an algorithm? No. Prop 122, is that going to help? Not some people. Even so, let's say that uh, there's this example of of the alleged, and I'm going to say alleged, 200 people that that Tony claims to have given $10,000 bonuses to. I want to see a list. I want to see names. I want to see pictures, and I want to interview them. Otherwise, it's a lie. I do not believe that they gave $210,000 bonuses. There's no reason to believe anything DoorDash says because they never provide facts, documentation, or metrics. I don't believe them. I don't believe you, Tony. Prove it. Somebody show me. I'm going to interview anybody that says they received it. I'm going to interview them and I want the proof. So there's 200 people in the world that allegedly received this bonus. Find one and send them to me. Send me to them. I dare you. Um, okay. So where are we going? We got nine minutes left before we go over to our friends in, in, uh, in uh, Echoplex Media. In stores, retail stores that, um, you know, frankly, more non, uh, non-restaurant stores than any other platform in North America. So we are giving dashers that choice of the choice to ruin your community of, and some dashers just love doing groceries yeah, again, but a lot of the in-between is quite different. You know, taking dealing with a passenger is pretty different than food delivery. You know, I think even grocery delivery is pretty different. So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of like, I always tell people that, you know, I think like they're almost like mutually exclusive. There's a, you know, if you do food delivery, you might try a little grocery delivery, but I don't think it's too, you know, too many people love food delivery and then they'll do a grocery delivery here and there. Um, there there's a lot of self-selection. I mean, I, I think you're totally right. I remember when we started the company 10 years ago. Um, we ran a very simple, very, very simple, you know, non, uh, statistically significant, um, I'm a math major, so I kind of have to, uh, it, you know, be careful with what I say here, but, but, it, um, you know, experiment where we had 20 DoorDash drivers and, um, you know, 20 Uber X drivers, I remember a week and, and, the, and, you know, both groups were making about $20 an hour. This is in Palo Alto in 2013. And I remember making a simple offer. Okay. When he talks about per hour, he's talking about per active hour. He's talking about per fractional hour that you work. So it may take three hours to have one active hour. So again, uh, there's lies and there's damn lies. Tony's into damn lies. He's into changing terms, changing metrics, using economics in a way and terminology in a way that is improper to confuse people and lie. That's what he does. You know, for $25 an hour to see if the, if the DoorDash drivers would drive Uber. Okay. So just, just for you guys. So I was a business consultant. I worked in the corporate world. I've had jobs that called me president. I've had jobs that called me big titles and I got a business degree from a very good school. I've done this type of analysis for a very long time. I've never seen a worse liar or a worse example of a corporation. Just, just a little background. And I'm not doing that. Like I'm just doing that to tell you that like, I'm not new to this world. Um, I'm kind of an old guy and I've got a lot of experience in this and anybody Sergio is, and I have a lot in common in that. Like he came from a finance background like we're fooled, not at all. But DoorDash puts on a great thing. There is no shame in being fooled, but it's time to wake up from that. Acts at the time, and if the Uber drivers would drive DoorDash, because just to see, like, you know, to your point, like how much of it was self-selection, how much of it was, um, you know, an overlap, and only one driver out of the 40 said yes to switch it. You know, and I, and I think, honestly, the answer was pretty obvious in my face, literal in my face, if I actually looked at it, because the two groups of people were totally different. You know, I mean, over 50% of the dashers are female, you know, a tiny percentage of ride-sharing drivers are female. Um, the average age of dashers was much younger, you know, 10 to 20 years younger than the average age of ride-share. The vehicles required are... are, are... Ride-share drivers aren't female because it's freaking dangerous as hell. Not that DoorDash isn't. ...are different. Obviously, you can use bikes and scooters a lot more in delivery versus in passenger um, uh, uh, delivery. And so... Our friend Luis Mingue, who writes uh, often in my Twitter, can tell us about uh, using a bike to delivery in DoorDash and how DoorDash uh, treats 
and Uber Eats treats people that uh, deliver on bikes. And why do they want you to deliver on a bike? Because they can't afford to pay you to deliver in a car. Are you picking up on this? Yeah, pa Pedro, Pedro gets paid not directly from DoorDash, but from all the ancillary advertising and views and everything else he does. So he created an industry and he deserves congratulations for building an audience. But you got to move forward. You got to tell the truth. You can't just build an audience and then shill for an evil global corporation for the rest of the time. You got to grow and evolve. And if that's calling Pedro out, then so be it, man. I mean, you got to tell the truth. If you're not telling the truth, I'm going to tell people who are not telling the truth. That's on you, not me, man. That's self-selection that you're talking about. We see in categories too, to your point. As I mentioned, some dashers just love a particular grocery store. It's not even grocery. I love this particular store. Yeah, yeah it's all about it's about I love, not money. Business. It's at the neighborhood level. And you uh, talk about the award because I think that's pretty cool. Okay, that's, this award and, is bullshit. I'm and not it's even just a small gesture, you. candidly. It's um, not a small uh, gesture. To, it's a, you know, it's those a fucking lie. I don't believe it. He's provided no proof of it. He showed a video of him telling people they got money. He didn't show any any videos of people receiving money, did he? No, because DoorDashers are anonymous. We don't fucking exist. Catch a clue. I mean, my God, how big a rubes can we be? Yes, Pedro's positivity. I mean, the problem I have with Pedro, if I was going to be critical, is that selling positivity with a scam is what cults do, right? Selling positivity in life is good. Selling positivity along with the gig economy is stupid, okay? Selling positivity with life, good. Positivity with gig economy, stupid, right? And so DoorDash always, you know, Pedro always says, you know, we're not about negative. We're not about, you know, we're not about blame, whatever. But Pedro blames the victims. Pedro blames the dashers for not being better. Well, who gives dashers training? Is everybody supposed to be a, a born a, a born a customer service uh, expert? What the hell kind of job do you have where they don't train you to be successful? If they don't train you to be successful, they don't want you to be successful. God damn it, I'm sick of this bullshit. How fucking stupid can we be? God damn it. Been with us since the very early days, right? And, and, and we've had a history of this. I mean, like, you know, when we used to start the company, I, I told you, I mean, the entire company did dashing. We, you know, had literally lounges yeah, they in were our learning how to, which was our office. They were learning how to screw you. Great job. They all did dashing. Yeah. For dashers. And we literally, for instance, you know, I'm super, you know, again, uh, we're going to be treated well. Maybe you would get priority support or, you know, you know, like I know you guys have some programs yeah. around top dasher and things like that. Um, but I feel like that's kind of lies, 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 lies. Kind of missing at times. And, you know, it's like, like you said something earlier too, you know, like my, my uh, acceptance rate is 0%, by the way. It was one, but it's down to zero. You guys have millions of dashers now, and I'm sure it's easy to look at them as a number on a spreadsheet, but, you know, a lot of these guys and gals are, you know, busting their butt, yeah. working hard, and, Door you know, like some often going, you know, the ex DoorDash only recently. I logged into DoorDash for the first time in, like, a really long time yesterday because I wanted to hook up with Para app. Uh, and, uh, and it actually made me identify myself as me. That was the first for me. So that was three over three years ago I did it. So DoorDash actually for the first time confirmed my identity. Um, I think most of the time DoorDash hasn't even cared who's doing the deliveries, whether it's honest from tax purposes or work purposes. Again, this is labor laundering. This is not legitimate business. They're laundering labor and failing to report to governments around the world and tax authorities around the world what labor is earning, what they're doing, how they're mistreating them, the safety hazards, everything else. Giant scam, giant fucking scam mile um and so i think it's kind of cool like really in, in, in your setup of the, the time opportunity but, but but there are dashers who who have done um lots of deliveries and view this as more full-time and, and for those okay so he's full of shit he's now going to rationalize why dashers work as if it's not for money some people do it because they like to deliver packages some people do it because they like to put their ankles behind their ears and be flexible and some people do it for money okay yeah, there's three categories you do it for fun for flexibility or you might do it for money anybody that wants to do it for fun or flexibility give me a give me a call and i'll take the money and you have fun and flexible times dashers whether it's the top dasher program as well as more rewards that you know worth both i mean they might be a small uh, we, you know dashers really cared about whether it was earnings plus i think you'd be able to get on the road and dash. I lie, 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 lie. it's the details that matter um and it's making sure that we're not just thinking about the system we're also thinking about the image yeah very cool well i appreciate you taking the time today i know dashers are gonna be excited to try the earn by time we didn't really get excited to cover that. as yeah. excited as hell oh earn by time yes exciting so the doordash algorithm that tony figured out will get you paid almost approximately the same for dashing with time as for dashing per order probably not quite as much but almost as much so 
You're welcome. He offered you a great option. Ash along the way, but I'm sure they have options. If it's safe, there is no issue. But that zero oh, point zero 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 is to make sure that is bullshit. Yeah, nine one one doesn't work. Give send DoorDash a message while you're getting raped and murdered. Excellent, excellent idea. Maybe third party support will will come to your rescue before the before the cop. We're minimizing any downtime as they're getting fired. It's a deal where you can share your real time location with the five contacts. You know, we also have to solve it during you know DoorDash as well. Got it. Well, very cool. Appreciate. Great job, Harry. Uh, Tony, Tony DoorDash, you are a giant piece of shit. Maybe the worst human being I have ever seen speak uh, in public.